has to be the most individual. And that is getting yourself to have whenever you need it, and not just when the occasion will call it forth, the capacity to convert negative drives to positive drives in yourself. And I was very pleased that in the section that you're reading from Kevin Danaher on the Seattle WTO protests, is that in Global Uprising, page 249, for those of you who didn't bring your reader with you today, he says, one of the tricky skills to develop is to take the anger and the pain and transform it into positive energy. And I, as I've said from the get-go, from the beginning, this is the fundamental nonviolent act. When you've done it, you can induce it in other people and you're on your way. Amy? Yes. Yeah. We, very good. Released it under discipline for maximum effect. So he, King, and that kind of, I hope you got the King quote that I sent out. Of course. Um, he is saying more, a little bit more about the active, you know, carrying it out, releasing it under discipline. But Kevin Danaher here is talking about the actual conversion, which is like a millisecond before that happens even. And he goes on to say, in those dark moments of the soul, you have to say, do I really have the right to wallow in self-despair because maybe we won't succeed? Which is, you hear that a lot. You know, oh, the problem is hopeless. The last woe is, woe is me. Or do you have an obligation to little kids dying in Africa or somewhere else and have to say, come on, let's get back in the ring? Uh, we have to convert positive action, start acting no matter how hopeless the situation may look. You've had your few moments of wallowing. I can't quite finish the sentence because we're on the air, but he uses a word that I don't want to use in public, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's right here in your book, page 249. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, unless you can bring this about, you're, the best that you're going to be able to do is carry out a behavior which you hope will signalize to people that you're not threatening them, and that, but on the other hand, you insist that they change. But when that is backed with this actual spiritual conversion, it has a much deeper impact. Um, now, so what are the techniques for training yourself to do this? Somebody else want to say it? <laughs> Save me from the embarrassment. Meditation. Thank you. Thank you. Eight o'clock in the morning or six p.m. in the evening. What you're actually doing is you're doing this on a small scale with every thought that comes up in your mind. Uh, Paula. Uh, Zoe, take care of this man after class. Yeah. Yeah. So more on more on this later. Uh, we, we know this is uh, this is seditious because every single year, uh, International Area Studies forgets to put this in the catalog and have to discover it at the last minute and put it back in. So that's our signal that this is a really useful thing to do. <laughs> but yeah, I won't say a whole lot more about it here because I could teach a whole course on it and it also is going to be webcast. And because as I say, it is, it's kind of an individual matter. But the important point is, I guess there's two important points to make about it. One is that this doesn't work very well if you do nothing particular, you do the same old, same old, and you hope that when you get into a tense situation that it will be there for you. That's, uh, that's dangerous folly. That is probably not going to work. This is something that you have to do when you're not in danger repeatedly so that it's there for you when you are in danger. There's a, a funny uh, saying in India that when, when you're going across one of these dangerous rope bridges that are swinging across this chasm and you have makaras, you know, crocodiles snapping away down below. They say, on the bridge, it's Rama Rama. Back on dry land, it's Kama Kama. <laughs> Rama being Rama and Kama being selfish desire. So that, that doesn't work very well. So you need a systematic way to respond all the time to negativity as it comes up in your own consciousness. Then when you're faced with a dire situation, the negativity will start coming up and you will transform it so that you can release it under discipline for maximum effect. My, my favorite kingism, and that's saying a lot. This guy is very, very good, very eloquent. So, but the second point I wanted to make is the fact that we read about this in a statement by Kevin Danaher, who is the co-founder of Global Exchange. Global Exchange, or GX as we call it in the field, is a wonderful organization, a good example of a stable, financially viable, uh, Nonprofits that is not explicitly dedicated to nonviolence. That's why they're stable and viable financially, but which actually does nonviolence in various ways. They don't insist on it, teach it, demand it, but they do things that fit very much into our framework and they're very much open to it. And Kevin Danaher's wife is Medea Benjamin, whom I'm sure you've heard of. She's the co founder of Code Paint and she's, she's been arrested innumerable times, which is the first step on the road to being declared a saint. <laughs> so uh, there's this question of spiritual practice and also it has to permeate your lifestyle. That's why. The most uh, common definition of principled nonviolence when we're trying to contrast it with other types is that it is a way of life. That's not how I go about it, but it's a reasonable way of doing it. Because if you get it deep enough to where it pervades your whole life, then you're operating on it as a matter of principle. Okay? So note that we started with a kind of training which is very difficult to document and which often people don't even associate with social change, but which the world in general is gradually coming to realize is an essential element. Elizabeth. Um, can we talk about this? I had actually lots of support about this one today. Uh -huh. And there was a Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Isn't step 10 in the 12-step program is meditation, I believe in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, you'll be happy to know that our meditation center has just written a booklet in conjunction with somebody who came through that program, just written a booklet on meditation for uh, AA people, AA or NA. This is a very good way of reaching out. Now, it is possible for a human being to harbor inconsistencies and contradictions. In fact, it's not possible for a human being not to harbor inconsistencies and contradictions. And so I think we should not say that anybody who goes through the 12-step program will be a nonviolent activist at the end of it. But it's definitely a method that people are recognizing that they need to capture negative energy and convert it into positive energy. And that's, we could use that. Great. So while this is the most important uh, level, and without it, we won't really have anything to mobilize, I don't think there's a whole lot more we can say about it here. And I'll, I'll go to the next level, which is, I'm calling it right now, handling emotions. This is very similar. There really is an overlap. And I think it's in this level, at this level, in this area, that the nonviolent communication comes into the picture. So we're going to hear that next week. And this is not primarily about 
Now let me start that again. This is not operating directly on the forces within your own psyche, but rather on their expression. You'll hear this very eloquently from Miki Kashtan next week. How can you interact with a person in such a way that you're responding to their needs in a way that helps them see their needs and your needs and go on from there? So this is a hugely successful program. I'll just nonviolent communication. It's one of the deeper and certainly one of the most successful ways of doing that. There are programs of a similar type. Like when we talked about uh, restorative justice, remember that interesting topic? We said that there were groups going out into prisons. One of them is called VORP, Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. But another is AVP, UP, which stands for the Alternative to Violence Project. So and one of the main things that they do is they take offenders who have been incarcerated and they uh, get them to, they teach them how to express themselves in language because a lot of the violent behavior comes from the inability to get respect, make your needs felt, and express yourself in words. If you learn how to do that, you don't have to hit somebody upside the head with a knuckle duster or whatever it is that you're going to use. Which is a very crude way to get respect, maybe even counterproductive. Okay. So, again, to pass on very quickly, but I mean, each of these things is you know, useful to explore further if it's any help to you in your papers and so forth. But there is a technique which has been relied upon for a long time, specifically within social change movements, and that's role playing. I would say that this is, because it deals directly with behavior and only indirectly with attitude, this is maybe a step more superficial than uh, nonviolent communication, which is in turn a big step more superficial than meditation, in my humble opinion. John? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I don't think we should rule out the efficacy of behavior altogether, but because it is possible to act out of one set of motives and conceal another, even from yourself, in itself, action is not the place I'd like to start. That's why I like to start it with the inner conversion. Then the action is bound to have its effect. But it's also the case, and psychologists have proven this, to the extent that you can prove anything in that field, that uh, if you act as if you felt kindness towards a person, it will resonate with the potentiality, at least, of feeling kindness towards them. It does have some effect, but it's just because the body is so much grosser than the mind, it's a very much cruder and in indirect way of going about changing the mind. Who was the uh, Artie was you? Just elaborate the thing is, uh, it'll only resonate uh -huh. if you don't feel the external force that's telling you to do that. Or it'll resonate more so if yeah. there isn't much of an external force. So because yeah. of that distance, that result, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm, I, I have to internalize this. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I suppose, our whole, the point that we call coercion versus persuasion, that if you can own something, even if you don't fully own it, if you act on it, it will have some impact. Whereas if you're doing it because somebody's ordering you to, you'll just be looking for a way to get out of it as fast as possible. Yeah, that's true. Um, so this role playing, I, I have to confess that uh, I was very snobbish about role playing. I thought, that, you know, I'm a meditator, I don't have to do this. And I went to a training camp one time for in the early days of nonviolent uh, intervention. And they were doing these role plays, and I said, you know, I, I didn't think it was very valuable, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm way too chicken to sit out and say, I'm not going to do this. So there I am being dragged in, just as Arby said, I should not have been, against my will, just because of social peer, peer group pressures. Uh, and I, I entered into this role play, and the, the thing, they were acting out what happened to David Hartzow in that uh, lunch counter. I was one of the people sitting at the lunch counter. There was a young woman sitting next to me, and there was this crowd of people playing the role of uh, rednecks who were attacking her. And the point of the role play was, what was I supposed to do? What, what should I do in this situation? Well, of course, you know, being a complete ham, the minute they started attacking this young woman, reminding myself that this isn't real, <laughs> I stepped in front of her and said, no, no, take me instead. <laughs> you know, I'm a nonviolence professor. I don't, I'm not saying this is very likely to happen in real life, but be that as it may, I did that. And they said, okay, we will attack you instead. Now, here's the point that I want to make. I mean, I've already made one point that I'm a hero. Okay, we got that, got that all down. But the real point I wanted to make is, the fact is, those people were very angry, and I was very afraid. So the, when the emotions are triggered, whether the event is real or you're just acting it out, it does trigger the same emotions and it does give you the same things to work with. And now, of course, we have this uh, stunning Zimbardo study, you know, Philip Zimbardo, a psychologist from Stanford, who took people and divided them into prison guards and prisoners, and you see how long it would, you know, they would run the experiment for all, see if it changed their behavior. They have to stop the experiment after one week because the quote prison guards were being sadistic. The sadism was real, even though the role was artificial. So, yeah, Matthias. It's interesting to know, to notice that, in, in a way, the other side, the military, the violent side, yeah. incorporates that they understood that a long time ago. Yeah. For example, when the soldiers were able to shoot others mm -hmm. from the other side, they were face to face, and mm -hmm. they were something in the military, you know, like, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Emotions, good point. You know, and now, and, and our side is, yeah. again, like, living behind them, we talk about what we need, that, what's yep. the problem, you know, yep. whereas the other side uses it. It, it works, let's use it. We're, we're spinning all these airy-fairy ideas here and congratulating ourselves that we don't need to do this. Of course, I'm a particularly bad example of that. I, mean, I was really snobbish in that regard. But it's true. Um, the military has overcome the resistance to kill by getting people to play it out in their fantasies. And a very good friend of mine, um, uh, Nowen, Henry Nowen, Belgian theologian, uh, you, you take care of that whole area of the world, as far as I'm concerned, a <laughs> Belgian theologian, he was sitting on a plane one time talking to someone who was doing the Vietnam War. This fellow was uh, an active combat duty in Vietnam, and so Henry Nowen said, how can you do this? He said, you know, when I went there, I had seen so many cowboy movies that I actually thought that the people I killed would get up and play again in another scene. That's how the fantasy had imposed itself on the reality. So why not use it uh, for positive means? And originally, it was just strategic. We would, they do a thing called hassle lines, where you're being a demonstrator, and you're standing there maybe locking elbows, and other people who are pretend policemen come up and try to harass you, get you off your, your stable emotional base, and by practicing with the emotions, then you're able to do it better when you go out on the lines. But if you saw the uh, PBS documentary, A Force More Powerful, the first or second segment is about the civil rights movement, and you'll actually see 
black and white film footage of James Farmer, who is still alive and well, thank God, doing role plays in the basements of churches in the South before they went out onto these demonstrations. So this has a relatively long pedigree in this field, and it also has been incorporated into institutions. It's not just something like you go to the local church and say, can we use your basement? But there's a well-known institution, the Highlander Folk School, which trained people. And it's interesting that it's a folk school. <laughs> not quite. It trained people to do this and to understand why they were doing study oppression and things like that. And you know, people think that Rosa Parks was just some random woman who happened to be sitting on a bus and just one day she just said, I've had it, I'm not going to move anymore. But in fact, she was a graduate of Highlander Folk School. So this, this does matter. You can train people and inject them into the world of social change activism in a more effective place than where they started. Okay. Now I'll put one other thing up here in this category, but if you can think of others, please let me know. There is a whole institution, I'm going to call it an industry, around conflict resolution or conflict mediation or conflict management. Sometimes people don't like the idea of going out and resolving any conflict that comes along because some conflicts are necessary. You need it to build out to your nonviolent moment. So if you get people to stop struggling and call that conflict resolution, it's very, very suspicious. I even have a, a colleague at this university who will not touch conflict resolution with a pole for that reason. But whatever we call it, conflict management or whatever, there's a very well-developed science now which operates in phase one of the, of the escalation curve. You know, as long as people can still talk to one another, we've got mechanisms for helping them to talk more effectively. Amy? Yeah. Yes, yeah. But whatever you, however you're particularly approaching it, there are skills that people have learned. And I guess one of the earliest and most influential works in this country was a book called Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urey at the Harvard Negotiation Project. So I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about that simply because other people do. And, you know, we've got phase one pretty well covered. That's the easy part to work on. So we've got to launch out into deeper areas. Okay, then there's the strategic level. And I'm, I'm talking mainly about social change activism here. Learning that there's a, better, there's a good, a smart way and a dumb way to do stuff is new in this, in this game. There's been militarists have known that you have to, in fact, the word strategy comes from the Greek word strategos, which means a uh, battle commander. Stratos means army and hegeawa means to lead. So they knew centuries ago, once again, and we are finally catching on, that yes, the point is not to understand things, but to change them. Yes, we all recognize that Karl Marx was correct about that. <laughs> but he was way too angry to be correct about a lot of stuff. He was correct about some stuff. But um, there's also such a thing as expressing your actions in an intelligent way that you thought about beforehand. And in this connection, there's actually a person who is uh, widely regarded as the dean of nonviolent strategy in the world today. His name is George Lakey. He comes from, he's based in Philadelphia, so as you might have suspected, he has shadowy Quaker origins. <laughs> but he has an organization called Training for Change. And he is actually, he gets contracts, you know, like a nonviolent peace force got started. They recognized they needed to do a lot of training. Maybe not as much as I thought they needed to do, but they needed to do a lot. And so, you know, you, you Google nonviolent trainers and you come up with George Lakey, Training for Change. And they hired him, brought him out to Indonesia to have a training camp for two or three weeks with people before they were sent to Sri Lanka. So I'm very happy about this, about the fact that these things are getting systematized and organized and uh, institutionalized. John, did you? I want to say John is, uh, and George is a, is a really good guy. There, there were people who worked with him who used to call him Flaky Licky, but I think it was just for the sake of the rhyme. I don't think there's really anything serious to it. Um, so, you know, he will take role play and a whole bunch of other stuff, and, and in a few weeks or however much you can afford, time-wise and money-wise, he'll train you how to do this. And he's far from being the only person. He's just sort of the most recognizable name right now. I'm happy to say, incidentally, that I got an email from a schoolgirl in some middle school somewhere back east who said her teacher asked her to write an essay on Gandhi, so she, she googled Gandhi expert and <laughs> came up with me, <laughs> which we are going to talk about the new technologies if we get around to it. Okay, so then after the strategic level, there's the technical level. And, you know, I'm not saying that these things don't overlap, but it's handy to look at it from these perspectives. And here, there, a lot has really been happening in the last couple of decades. You remember my saying that when you're training people for nonviolent intervention, TPNI, one, of the th one level of stuff that they have to learn is how to behave appropriately in the target culture that they're going to. It's so easy to make stupid mistakes and get misunderstood. And I remember my son-in-law who was invited to teach medicine in Japan, they, they had to coach him on how you say yes and how you say no in Japanese. <laughs> because, for example, no is <laughs> things like that. And so people will never, they will never say yeah, which is the Japanese word for no, they will because that's way too impolite. No, they, will move, they will let you know that the answer is no, but they won't say it. But if you're a European, or God forbid, an American, where everything is on the surface straight up, let's sock it to him. And so he didn't say no, so you go out and sign this billion dollar contract only to find out that it was based on thin air. So that's just one sort of amusing example.